We are live with another broadcast here from Los Angeles, and we are connecting with Seattle today and Jared Mursky with Wick and Mortar. And you can see the website running right there. We'll get back to that in a second. I just wanted to say good morning here from Los Angeles and uh, to you, Jared Mursky. How's it going? Good, man. Good. Excited, to, uh, excited to have you on. Uh, this is uh, a little bit different, a little bit, uh, you know, not different in the marketing and, the, and branding and scaling and creation of assets online, but, you know, the industry of, of cannabis. Uh, I'm just very curious. Uh, if you can take me back, Jared, a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, I think you started 10 years ago, this business. Yep. How, how did it start and, and why? And, and uh, what are some of the reasons for you uh, still doing this very successfully today? Uh, well, when I started uh, in 2009, um, I... Uh, it was really interesting actually i had walked into a dispensary and i realized how incredibly hideous the stores looked and you know given there wasn't really strong packaging then it was really just you know drug dealers dropping off you know bales of weed in a duffel bag and letting oh. the dispensary kind of put it in their own little plastic bottle and it was just it wasn't good it wasn't attractive and ultimately um i knew that by you know kind of transitioning my creative skills into uh, an industry that was really not much of one at the time, I felt like uh, I could really help kind of turn the needle, so to speak, you know? So my mission since day one has been to, you know, uh, change the perception of cannabis on a global level, one brand at a time. And I feel like I've been doing a pretty good job of doing that. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the industry was, the industry was crazy then. It was, um, I only worked with dispensaries actually, because, the growers, they didn't want to be found. You know, they lived in the shadows. Uh, I actually yeah. remember a time where I would get paid in, in uh, cannabis and cash, and then I'd sell the weed, and then I'd make the money, and then I'd grow my agency. Now, that was a long time ago, but, um, well, now you can see how the industry's uh, changed. Yeah, that's very interesting. And, and uh, was this uh, sort of born from, uh, you know, we talked to a lot of entrepreneurs and self-starters on this uh, this broadcast, and before you even walked to that, into that store that day, was this something that was sort of uh, born into you from early on in your, uh, in your childhood? When I, start, when I was 19, I started getting into design work when I was uh, promoting nightclubs. Um, I was spending about 3,500 bucks a month on graphic design and realized that I could probably do it myself, um, which was a challenge in and its own, but I got good eventually. And before I knew it, I was, uh, you know, doing uh, graphic design for all the nightclubs. And it was then that I realized that, hey, you know what, maybe this is my passion. And I fell in love with design and I fell in love with just uh, being creative in general. And um, it was then that I had me started meeting some dispensary owners and they were, they basically pitched me the idea of, hey, you should come do some design work for us. And I thought, well, shit, this is a, an interesting opportunity to develop, um, you know, uh, an agency focused on a very specific niche, that being cannabis. And that was really how it started. Um, I called my company at the time, Online Marijuana Design, which is not a creative name, I know, but it ranked well in search engines. And more importantly, again, as I mentioned, you know, the, the type of business owner then was, a, there were drug dealers. And so there weren't really any ancillary businesses that existed other than hydroponic shops, high times and us. And then Dope Magazine came out and and I started working with them, but ultimately, um, yeah, it, it was just a, uh, it was just an evolution. And having been there since the beginning, watching each state go from black market to medical to recreational, and I've had the opportunity to learn all the rules and regulations with respect to each state as they've kind of come about. So it's yeah. been uh, it's been an interesting interesting transition. So online marijuana design, um, circling back, we then rebranded to Wick and Mortar. Uh, about two two years ago now, year and a half ago, something like that, um, and we just really felt like we were plateauing. You know, when you know your business and you've owned a business long enough, you just start to feel things. And online marijuana design was certainly a means to an end. It wasn't something that we felt would transcend into the mainstream world, but ultimately got us pretty far. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it was it was definitely an evolution and certainly a learning process. Yeah, yeah, lots of learning in a mm -hmm. in a very sort of a, yeah, I should just say interesting industry. Now uh, you mentioned uh, SEO or search engines. You know, I, I'm sure in those early days, uh, especially 
this was not something that you wanted to necessarily be publicly known for. So it was more on the ground, perhaps, and more handshakes and networking. But as you started to get more visible and, you know, sort of the community at large and the industry, as you said, sort of started to expanding from, you know, sort of that uh, in the backhanded alleyways and whatnot to be more publicly uh, available and also recognized. How did you... Uh, promote yourself in terms of the digital assets that you were uh, creating, both for clients and for yourself? Well, it wasn't, re remember, it wasn't much of an industry then. It was really just yeah. black market, right? And so um, it was all referral. Yeah. Uh, it was just a matter of going to dispensaries and saying, hey, look, I can help you evolve. Look what I've done for this company. Look what I can do for you. And letting, know, letting people know that, hey, there is somebody out there that can service them because I think a lot of people from a professional perspective didn't feel like they wanted to bring that level of professionalism into an industry that wasn't already being taken very seriously in the first place. I just happened to like cannabis. So I was like, you know what, this sounds really cool. Why not try it? And it worked out really well. Um, I think it was in about 2013, 2014, um, maybe sooner. Their, their conferences started to emerge. Um, in the medicinal space of cannabis and of course uh being at the forefront of the design um, and branding and marketing arena in the cannabis industry i felt it best to start speaking um i remember my first conference it was very nerve-wracking in fact one of my friends had to come up and help me um but now i speak at like 20 to 30 conferences a year so it's it's something i'm very comfortable with but yeah long story short it's it, it's evolved it's a it, it's changing still every single day. It yeah. Blows my mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, just to get into your organization as it sits today, uh, how many employees and, uh, you know, how do you work today when you take on a new client? Like you obviously have scaled up your organization from your own self uh, using just your, you know, creative skills. And then, of course, into more business and speaking and really mm -hmm. become quite successful at that. Um, you know, what's a little bit of the background of how you interact with clients and, how you work uh, sort of from a internal perspective to develop these assets for clients? That's a lot of questions in one answer, but I'll yeah. try and do my best. Um, oh gosh, where do I start? So we've got uh, 15, 15 full-time people. Uh, we work with 20 plus subcontractors all over, uh, writers and so forth. Um, uh, and then as far as you know, the type, of, let me start with the type of work that we do. Maybe that'll kind of pre give, give the kind of set the, set the table, so to speak. So um, Wick and Mortar specializes in, you know, building brands, soup to nuts. We do take on clients with existing brands, of course, but we've found that in the cannabis industry, a majority of the brands in the space could use a rebrand or an evolution. So it just happens to be that a majority of the branding work we do is rebranding and brand evolutions, even with existing brands, of course. And so um, I would even say a lot of the work we do is focused on CBD space. Uh, yeah. We've been building a lot of CBD specific brands, um, you know, working with uh, distribution uh, distributors, uh, various different investment capital firms. I mean, we have clients from all walks of life, so we don't work with clients that just touch the plant. Um, we have clients in various different technology spaces, you know, Headset is a client of ours. Um, they're actually located here in Seattle. The founders of that company started Leafly, uh, which you may have heard of. Um, yep. So it's, we have a fairly large diversification of client types, um, ranging from just different personalities to different types of businesses. So it's, it's really interesting, especially when you can have a business where a guy will come in with tattoos all over his neck and his arms and then his business partner sitting next to him be dressed in a suit you know it's uh it's really cool it's like um i, I never thought that i'd have a company that i could go into a back room and and you know spark up a joint with uh you know some bankers and be like hey let's, let's have a chat and it's totally okay it's um just it, it's, it's it's such a fun industry to work in um now to kind of circle back to the second or third part of your question and i think that was you know what what is our i guess what is our process like how do we like how do we work with clients and you know it really just starts with understanding you know 
what is their value proposition? Um, and I guess, you know, that is also spe specific to their business. And I think when you look at a lot of the businesses coming into the cannabis industry that do touch the plant or sell a product, so to speak, there is very little brand proposition or value proposition. And some of the things that we've learned, especially over the years, is that, you know, a lot of these products just exist to get you high. Um, and, and that's fine, but if you can add additional layers into your brand, like for example, social responsibility, which can have a, a pretty decent impact on the presentation of your business optically, especially given the fact that consumers tend to spend more money when they know they're investing in something that is benefiting some something greater than themselves. Um, it's, uh, you know, when you look at, I think it was uh, Pantene Pro-V, uh, no, it was Head and Shoulders. Head and Shoulders um, is now selling, uh, all of their plastic packaging is, 25% of it comes from the ocean. So it's recycled plastic, ocean plastics. Now the product, they, because of that process and the integration, their product is a little bit more expensive, but their sales have increased dramatically. So it just goes to show you that people are willing to spend a little bit more money on something, especially when they know it's going towards a greater good. Yeah. Which I think is pretty powerful. Yeah. So, gosh, you know, they're, they're really just a ton of, it's, it's really, again, matter about bringing value proposition or um, uh, bringing value proposition to these brands, because again, a lot of them just don't have that. Uh, it's also helping brands better identify who they are as a company. Um, oftentimes they come to market in a hurry and uh, skip a lot of steps. And so um, a lot of the companies that we're seeing are having trouble raising capital or um, just a confusion in the market or they have what we call bipolar branding. It's just a hodgepodge of design work from a bunch of different designers. And so the messaging and the visual language is just so far off. It's hard to really understand what the overall message is. So it's, it's a lot. I mean, and again, we have clients of, of all sizes, you know, ranging from, you know, the underdog farmer to, you know, Aurora Cannabis, a five and a half billion dollar company. Wow. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a really interesting and diverse market. Yeah. Hopefully well, I answered that well enough for you. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a great explanation because I was going to try and drill into the specifics of the types of clients and you, you summarized it nicely there. Uh, you know, some friends of mine are familiar with uh, this space and we've talked about it on and off. And last year uh, mm -hmm. we almost got involved in some e-commerce uh, for uh, CBD oil, right? Mm -hmm. CBD oils and, uh, you know, it's an interesting space. And um, I understand also that there's a lot of uh, conflicts within, you know, the political system around this. Uh, I saw uh, an article, I think it was uh, uh, just yesterday, actually, on this uh, here in California, that they're saying the cannabis industry is going to be extinct if they don't get these retailers to get licenses that said, I mean, how much and that like when you're speaking, how much do you talk about like your company as one, you know, the client, the interaction, as you just said, but also politically or, or even globally, because basically you're not just saying, hey, I want to work locally, you're taking this to a global discussion. And I'm sure you're dealing with a lot of political issues and constraints in the uh, in the marketplace. Sure. And I mean, we are a global agency, as you know, Canada yeah. is recreationally legal. Um, they're fully legal. And so Aurora being out of Canada, um, you know, we've had a, we, we've, we've learned a lot through uh, that relationship, even working with the um, SEC um, yeah. and helping companies um, go public or companies that are already public um, because that's a different language all on its own. But you have to understand that each state as well as Providence and as well as country, they all have very, very different rules and regulations when it comes to understanding how cannabis is packaged to down to um, the lingo, the lingo you can use on your website, down to the pictures that you can use. I mean, it, it is extremely, extremely strict in some areas as where others, it may be far more loose. And so you have to really understand the language of regulation um, in the cannabis industry because it is quite easily the, the, the easiest thing to make mistakes in, especially when you're trying to transcend one brand from one state into another and then take that into another country. And I mean, uh, a, a buddy of mine was telling me about a project where he was trying to move one brand um, into from from uh, the U.S. into Europe, and, oh, yeah. and the company was called Puff, which made sense. 
Um, and, you know, like, you know, you puff a smoke or, you know, whatever. But in um, Europe, it means something completely different. Completely different. It's homosexual, which is fine. But I would imagine that it's a completely different brand message from what they had originally intended. So perhaps moving in that brand into Europe um, with that name really doesn't make the most sense unless it's the messaging that you're going for. Um, right. Again, we can find out what our original intentions. Uh, you know, you just have to be very, very careful, even with respect to, again, trying to move a brand from one country into another without having that global knowledge and an understanding of, you know, just the cultural or indif cultural indifferences. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, how, how much of your work do you find that you deal with these uh, uh, constraints or, or differences in markets and, and countries et cetera, in uh, sort of getting your name out there as well? Because you obviously speak and you have your, you know, 10 years in the industry, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how much mm -hmm. time do you spend on this? Uh, a lot. I mean, yeah. I speak at a lot of different groups. So I've, um, you know, EY and MNP, uh, so Ernst & Young MNP, and then, um, you know, other other corporate companies too, where I'll go and I'll speak and, and talk about, you know, regulation. But, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm, uh, gosh, I can't remember if we've published this or not yet, but uh, we wrote, I recently wrote an article about how to give your Canadian cannabis brand a life without a lifestyle, because much like the rules and regulations in Australia, you can't have any kind of lifestyle attributed to the brand in Canada, right? Any consumer facing brand, which seems silly because it's not at all like cigarettes and the side effects are what? Laughter and hunger, right? So right. Um, nonetheless, there are those limitations. And so we as a creative agency have to be very smart and savvy as far as how, as, as far as to how we want to kind of give this give these brands a life without a lifestyle again because the you know the Canadian government is pretty damn strict when it comes to you know those rules and regulations and so you know some of the things that we've been able to do as an example you know create an augmented reality experience that kind of shows um, a walkthrough right of the facility and they get to see the employees smiling and happy and and uh, you know maybe you click on it and there's a video in the experience and you can actually hear an employee talk and so you get to you get to hear them and that's that's an employee that is not an actor there's no lifestyle this is just us letting you in to experience um what it would be like to enter into our facility or their facility so to speak and so yeah. there are ways to give brands a lifestyle without giving them a lifestyle that makes sense that makes oh, sense yes yeah yeah that makes sense that's very interesting and so you, you have know, to be clever yeah yeah and and then you see elon musk on joe rogan's uh, podcast you know and you know that that probably just enhances that discussion you know times 100 but do you do you get uh, any pushback uh, i mean there's obviously levels levels of society here but um, you know, i don't do you, and i don't care either i'm not really worried about what people think because if i was i would have never started my company in the first place and i wouldn't be where i'm at um i have no doubt that this industry is going to grow and evolve more and more and more and you know, when companies are asking me to, you know, bring them on as a client, but also join their partnership group as an equity partner, simply for advisory, it means I'm probably doing something right. And so, you know, hell, I'll even swear from time to time during a speech, if it makes sense just to get people's attention, because again, I'm, I'm about being bold and outspoken and, and really making sure that people are listening, because I think when you look at a lot of the information that's being kind of shared amongst people in the cannabis industry, it's for the most part fairly regurgitated and very rarely ever anything tremendously new. And so I want to be an inspiration to speakers, you know, in the cannabis industry, but also those uh, in the creative world to just speak up and be different. You know, it's, I always talk about the Dollar Shave Club campaign and a lot of conversations I have when I talk to clients about how we take them through the, um, you know the 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 brand the the brand mood board process and helping them identify their personality because I think they are a good representation of uh, a company that took a smart risk 
and develop yeah. a personality that was really funny and comical and witty. And, and I just, I love that story because it, it ultimately gave them the ability to come up with that commercial, which they spent very little money on producing, yet it went viral. And so when you look at the impact they had on the razor industry, given the three competitors, Brit, you know, Schick, Gillette, and Braun, some of the monsters, yeah. I mean, they all looked really the same. There wasn't really anything that really stood out that differentiated, you know, either of one from the other. And so I just really love the story of that Dollar Shave Club. And so I feel like, I feel like, again, giving people very specific instances of areas and opportunities that are relatable to them and in the cannabis industry can really help them grow and evolve. Um, I'm about giving as much free information as I can. Um, as long as I don't have to talk to every single person at a time, I can do it to the masses. And it's, again, it's, it's really paving that mission that I mentioned. And that's, you know, changing the perception of cannabis uh, on a global level, one brand at a time. I didn't say that I had to build every brand. I just want every brand out there to be good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, that's, uh, that's great. That's, uh, that's awesome. Um, in fact, uh, as we're coming up on the last few items here, uh, this is really uh, great, Jared. Um, what uh, you, you mentioned here is uh, one of the questions that I had for you is to build a strong organization. You talked about talent, and, and we know we have we need to have good people, obviously, all around us. But you, you, if you can break that down a little bit, the essence of that, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I learned from investors, especially being in a service-based business, is that you know they they invest in your, your intellectual part of your intellectual property is your is your talent, your team, and. Um, you know, I've, I've pretty much always worked for myself for a majority of my life. Yeah. And so I never felt like any of the teams I ever worked on where I was working for someone were ever very strong. They didn't really create the best company culture. And so I knew that when I created my company, I wanted it to be like Rob Deirdre's fantasy, Rob Deirdre's fantasy factory. I wanted to have all the things I wanted, you know, I wanted to be fun. I wanted to be able to smoke weed at work. I mean, <laughs> I wanted to be able to create a place that I would want to come to every single day and never want to leave. And that's kind of been like a little personal internal mission. And so, you know, I've just, I just learned to, uh, you know, really invest in top talent. I mean, my, my director of operations, Kirk Grogan, he just did a Ted talk. He is absolutely amazing. Super, super smart. I, he, in the very short period of time that he's been here has helped me grow my company immensely. Um, you know, I just recently brought on, um, James Zahodny came formerly from Dope Magazine. He's one of the co-founders. Um, recently left and has uh, joining Wick and Mortar. So we're super excited about that. Um, my creative director, Derek Moeller, uh, he's been one of my good friends for a very long time. And um, he originally started off by creating video content for us uh, and did some design work, but uh, it got to a point where you know, we really realized that we could benefit from more of this time. And so I worked my ass off to basically afford all of these people. And, um, and now I, now I get to come to work and I get to hang out with all of my friends. I don't never want to leave. It's perfect. It's That's awesome. great. Yeah. I love it. It's, uh, doesn't feel like work at all. In fact, when I go to fly to go to conferences, I actually miss coming home because I like hanging out with all my friends so much. <laughs> Yeah, you're a you're a passionate passionate and talented guy, uh, Jared. I can I can tell. This is awesome. That. You're, uh, that. Um, uh, in, in fact, uh, you know, you speak about you know people here. One of the sort of uh, tongue in cheek questions I had is your superhero. I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> who, who is that? God, you know, it's so funny. Um, somebody asked me that the other day, and I was like, it would be like, sounds really weird, but it would be. <laughs> Superman, if, if Superman and Doctor Strange had a baby, that's, that's, that's. <laughs> Smoking weed at the same time. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, I think because I would want to like, you know, I would want to be able to, you know, travel back and into the, you know, back to the future and into the future and, you know, yeah. going yeah, yeah. and, um, but I'd also want to be like, you know, indestructible. So, the best of both worlds, if you yeah. will. Maybe it's uh, maybe that's that's a, that's a tough that's a tough one. And I think it's because only John only because it's I I, I love I watch every Marvel series of everything. So um, yeah, like I'm obsessed with Marvel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yep. <laughs> Tony Stark. Yeah. Um, yeah my, oh, Tony Stark's the best. Actually, if I had to choose just one and I couldn't choose Superman, Tony Stark would definitely be it. That's that's the guy right there. Yeah. Yeah. He was. I was Tony Stark for Halloween two years ago. Oh, so yeah, Iron Man. Really oh, yeah. that one. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Had the had the palm lights and everything. Built my whole. Yeah. Oh, cool. But I realized, but I, the thing I realized is that when I put this like red leotard thing on with all the armor, I I couldn't pee. <laughs> so yeah, that was that was that was I had to have you, somebody help me. But you could smoke, right? I could smoke. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you mentioned traveling. Uh, you know, just at the end here, uh, any cool travel hacks or any sort of uh, insights? You know, from uh, from a traveler around the the globe and and the, and the nation. Um, <laughs> get TSA pre-check. Oh, good one. It's a lifesaver. Um, TSA pre-check. Yeah. yeah. The last thing you want to do is sit in a line for two hours and miss your flight. Um, that's a bummer. Uh, gosh, what else? Don't travel with your cannabis. Um, what else? Yeah, man, I think that's about it. Wink, wink on the wink, 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 wink. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I may have done it, may have not not done it, but let's just say I've never been caught. Um, no, it's LAX actually just, uh, even though I'm based out of Seattle, LAX actually said that they don't care. You know, if they see weed, they're just gonna let you fly with it. Yeah. So, yeah, and I guess they do a little bit of measuring on, on the person too. And, uh, you know, you look at your history and whatnot. I mean, there's mm -hmm. ways to, to find out a little bit more about you than you probably, probably would like, but you know. <laughs> That's a, that's the government for you. Well, that this, is, yeah. Makes yeah. getting into Canada a pain in the ass, I'll tell you. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. sure, the Canucks. Uh, well, this is great, Jared. I uh, I know uh, we uh, scheduled this for a while, and you're a busy guy. I'm very glad to to have you on. What's the best place uh, people can uh, can reach you? Obviously, we we saw the website and the awesome uh, wickedmortar.com right there. Uh, yep. Where else? Uh, what's the best place? Um, Instagram. Uh, Jared Dot Mursky, and then um, also LinkedIn. I'm very responsive on there, so people can follow me there as well. Um, I also have a fan page, Facebook fan page. So I think it's Mr. Mursky, and then uh, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, and then uh, you can you can uh, shoot us an email every time a um, uh, a project request goes through our website. I actually get that directly in my inbox so I have visibility on everything beautiful that's how you beautiful. get a hold of me that's awesome that's awesome uh, also you mentioned speaking do you have any books or any resources that uh, they could access or even just in the industry at large that you might even recommend yeah so if you go on Amazon there's a book I'm in um, produced by entrepreneur media yeah um, and it's uh, gosh I'm trying to remember the name of the book hold on <laughs> let me pull it up real quick it's been so long how to, it's basically how to start your own cannabis business. Oh, that's what it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. By Entrepreneur Media. Yep. Okay. Um, and then, uh, let's see, what else? Yeah, I'm speaking at South by Southwest on Wednesday. So if anyone is there, I will be speaking uh, on a panel um, on the cannabis and branding, uh, cannabis branding and marketing track. Um, I'm going to be speaking in Jamaica and Colombia, and so. For all of those who are listening, who may be out there, um, if you are, hit me up, and uh, I'd love to connect. That's great, Jared. Uh, awesome interview. I really appreciate your time once again, and uh, look forward to uh, continuing this uh, this discussion offline. And we're obviously connected as well. So yep. best of luck to you and the organization. And uh, yeah, great uh, great times out in South by Southwest for sure. Yeah, buddy. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, likewise. Have a good one, Jared. Take care. All right, see you.